So why don't we start with a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I came up um, in a different life. You know, my parents, um, my dad worked for Dow Chemical, um, and and but he he was involved with patents and all kinds of things at Dow for different chemicals. And so my mom, she owned a daycare. Um, she did that. Um, most of her life and so uh i mean her adulthood that i can remember and so um a lot of the things that how i came up i mean they taught me a lot of work ethics and different things of that nature but you know when i was um you know nine between like nine and 12 years old i was molested um by a a, a young lady who um who went to my church and so um for me um, life just became very different. I didn't, I didn't really talk, talk to my parents about it. Um, I just didn't. Um, but the thing that I, I learned, um, from that was that, you know, it, life is not always going to hand me exactly everything that I ever wanted, but you know, that type of, um, behaviors back in the, you know, eighties, people didn't really talk about, you know, people being molested and things of that nature. But um, for me, um, um, that was my life. And so I grew up, you know, kind of, uh, you know, did well in, in school, but uh, I stuttered. Um, I, I stayed in speech therapy from the age of um, like, I don't know, five to I graduated high school. Like I was always in speech therapy. Uh, I graduated with honors. Um, but I started, you know, using substances uh, around the age of, um, what, 15 years old. Uh, and, and by the time I graduated high school, I was addicted to um, drugs, selling drugs, and just a lot of things like that. And so I ended up going to college. And when I went to college, I, um, um, within one year, I was kicked out of school for possession uh, I was selling drugs on campus, uh, and and I ended up going into the criminal field. I mean, the criminal world. Um, I stayed involved in 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 going back and forth to jail, violated like three times, and then um, at the age of 24, um, well, really like 23, I finally got off of probation. Uh, I was working for a chemical plant, and I decided that. Uh, I wanted something more in life. So I ended up going to college, um, back to college at that time. Um, and I ended up graduating in like two and a half years, two and a half, um, yeah, about two and a half years. After I graduated, I mean, oh, well, well, during that, um, a professor came to me and, and, and asked me, you know, to be part of the debate team. Um, I had never debated, never did any of that. Um, I, he ended up giving me a scholarship um, for changing my major. I changed from computer science to um, to um, public relations communications, and so I did the, all the stuff in the communication world, and and then I graduated. Um, you know, I was number eight in the nation um, for for debate when I left, and whenever I went to go look for a job, I ended up becoming a school teacher. Uh, I had a superintendent give me an opportunity because you wasn't supposed to teach um, with a um, with a, a drug record, um, but he gave me an opportunity to teach. And once I started teaching, um, I was teaching at a magnet school, and at the magnet school, I, um, I I fell in love with the students, and I wanted to talk to them more. So they told me that I needed to get a degree in counseling. So I went and got a, a master's in, in, in educational counseling. When I finished that, I got the second track that was the, the clinical side. And ever since then, I've worked with, you know, um, uh, autism to um, all spectrums of, of autism, Asperger's, um, doing behavioral work. Um, um, people that were oppositional defiant, um, those were the people that I started out um, when I left the education world. And then I ended up working at, at the health department here in Frederick um, for about 10 years. I started out as a lay counselor. And then by the end that I left in 2017, I was a, 
a program manager right underneath the, the director and the deputy director. And I started this business, Brooks Behavioral Health Services, in, uh, in 2017. And we're going on three years with, um, you know, winning best of the best in 2019 and in 2020. So that's kind of how I got here. Wow. David, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, I feel like I can't continue the interview without saying that I'm so sorry that that happened to you in your childhood and just how much I admire how you've turned your life into a really resilient and beautiful story. So thank you so much for sharing. I, I think that helps me put my perspective on how I write this piece a little bit better. Um, just so I'm aware, it sounds like the molestation was formative to the drug issue that you had in your youth, but I don't want to make that public with, I don't, I don't know if that's something that you want public. And so just tell me what you want filtered out of that story, or if you are, or if you're fine to have anything in the piece, uh, how do you feel about that? I would have never told you if I cared about where it goes. I mean, um, to be right. honest, to be honest, I'm, 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 I'm glad that I, I, I wouldn't say that I appreciate the young lady doing what she did to me, but it it was it built my character. It built who I am as a person, and and with that, I I I've I went through some of the hardest moments in my life, and I've been through moments after that. But um, I got through that, and I can get through anything else. So that's the reason why. Um, I don't regret anything um, in my life, so uh, you could publish anything that you would like. Tell me a little bit about how the transition from your job at the health department to starting your own business. What what caused you to make that leap? How, why why did you do what you did? Well. Um, I put it to you like this. I was um, working with um, uh, Charlie Smith and, and a couple other uh, entities, um, um, a couple judges and, and, you know, public defenders and state's attorneys. And we were working on veterans court. And during veterans court, um, one of the, the young men who, who was um, uh, in, the, in the program uh, asked to, uh, he was given the opportunity to go home um, from jail. And he was probably halfway through our program. It was a, 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 a four, four month program. It used to be a three month, but then when I got there, uh, I decided that 16 weeks would be, uh, no one should be able to leave jail um, earlier than that. And so, um, so I turned it into a 16 week of curriculum work that I had wrote. And, and from there, he asked to, um, to stay in jail to finish the program because it had never looked at and addressed the things that we were working on, which was criminogenics. And, and whenever I started presenting, changing that program to criminogenic um, therapy, uh, where it's the, the, the thought process behind people that commit crimes. And so once I got that solidified and this young man said that he would rather stay in jail than to, um, than to be released, um, that let me think like, why, why, won't, why isn't anybody in the community doing criminal work? Why do you always have to be in jail to receive that? So. Uh, oh, wow. I, so I decided to um, build a business that was all on uh, criminal thinking. Uh, and, and yes, I do uh, other mental health um, that's not um, um, de directly related to criminal behavior. But just like I had told you earlier, I had been doing work with autism and, and different uh, uh, aspects of mental health, but it was all behavioral. And so whenever I started doing substance and criminal behavior, um, that is like the, the, the epitome of behaviors. Like no one knows how to, um, to curve criminal behavior because regular mental health and regular substance abuse doesn't change the criminal thinking. So um, 
I talked to my wife and, and she was on board and we just literally just walked away from everything, all benefits and all the packages and vacations and all of that. We we jumped in the boat to be a, a owner of a business uh, and to see how it went. And literally we've been successful ever since, thank God. And you co-own this business with your wife, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, me and my wife are 50-50. So tell me more about your business. Like I get a sense of how it started and how there was a need in the community. Um, so tell me about your services currently and what else is in the future for your business? So um, right now we are, um, uh, it's me. Um, my wife is, uh, is um, like I said, owner. Uh, have the money, um, insurance. She looks over all that kind of stuff. Uh, I have a, a front desk um, who's my office manager. She controls pretty much everything, all the paperwork and communication. Um, her name is Kristen Campbell. And then I have a doctor on staff, um, Dr. Haber, Dr. Richard Haber, and he does the mental health um, medication management. So those are our core, um, um, our core business right now. But um, prior to COVID, we were planning on opening up uh, a, uh, a new program um, that would open up more uh, mental health because we had the business in Thermont um, and we had opened that office up. Um, but um, we ran into some issues during the COVID, um, not really financial, but just kind of uh, location and just movement. And we just decided to just streamline everything, come back, bring everything back to Frederick. Um, so within probably by February, we'll bring everybody back to Frederick. We're expanding this Frederick office and we'll be probably hiring uh, one or two more therapists. And you chose to open your business up in Frederick because that was where the need was, correct? Yeah, exactly. It was, it was the, I wanted to be downtown. I wanted to be close to the homeless. I wanted to be, um, I wanted to be in the middle of everything. Uh, I didn't want to be on the outskirts because that's not the type of population that I was looking for. What are you hoping for the future of Brooks Behavioral Health Services? During the, during the COVID, I started a thing called Cadillac Counselor. Um, right now, I'm in the process of finishing up the, the trademark. Uh, um, I think I have, what, another 10 days to go, and then it'll be published. Um, so ultimately, um, Brooks Behavioral Health Services will be kind of its, its own entity. I'm going to kind of start stepping back from Brooks Behavioral Health and, and start really um, pushing the Cadillac Counselor. That's where I do a lot of consulting, uh, a lot of presentations. Um, and, and I split, like right now I do uh, two days, um, two days at the Mount, at Mount St. Mary's. I teach in the, in the psychology department and the uh, human services department. Uh, so with that, I do that on Tuesday and Thursdays for half a day. And then I come back to to my office. So um, really and truly for me to grow Brooks Behavioral Health Services, eventually I'm going to have to slowly kind of step myself out outside of it um, so that I can do like a lot of my personal things that I do like on social media, uh, YouTube. I do a lot of talks um, on mental health, um, just anything that stresses people out. Uh, I do news. I talk about news and politics, just uh, how how it kind of relates to me as a person and the stresses in the community. Where did the name Cadillac Counselor come from? <laughs> I mean, I just always I've always loved Cadillacs. I got an old uh, I got an old ninety um, Broham right now. Um, it's a big long body i pull it out every once in a while and and everybody just always knew that i, I ride cadillacs and so uh it was just the perfect thing you know when you hear you know the lincoln lawyer uh why not be the cadillac of counselors you know it's like the <laughs> the best of the best it's about it's smooth it's it's smooth it's a smooth ride it's just it's comfortable 
And that's what I think of my counseling style. I love that. Has being black influenced you as a business owner? Um, influence, what do you mean by influence by being black? What do you mean? Has your race at all affected how your experience as a business owner? Has it, I don't know, in any way shaped or not shaped how you've, you know, your story, how you've uh, manifested your business now, the decisions you make in the future? If at all, if it, if it hasn't, then that's fine. I just wanted to ask the question if there was an answer. No, that's fine. I mean, you, you know, you got to understand, I came from Houston, Texas, um, a, a little south of uh, outside of Houston, a couple minutes outside. And, and where I was from, I mean, racism was everywhere. I mean, people, um, people say that there's not racism. They're a lie. I mean, I've been I've been called a nigger right on the right on a football field by a coach. You know what I mean? Like my parents, I remember my parents won uh, yard of the month one year, um, one month, and somebody wrote nigger across the front of the the sign that they put on the on in your yard from the from the city. So um, <clears throat> it's just. Um, it 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 so whenever I started my own business, just in in business in general, um, people are are just kind of stereotypical. Um, even though you don't want to be um, looked at by your race, because I don't I don't want to be judged by being black. Um, but but there's just sometimes that you just see things in the business world where you just kind of stop and you're like, man, that was racist right there. You know, and so I just kind of got tired of dealing with all of just people's opinions and how they feel. And, and I just said, you know what, if I start my own business, then I never have to work for anybody. I never have to put up with anybody ever being, you know, um, you know, sexist, classist, whatever, you know, uh, anything like that. Um, I don't have to deal with it anymore. And so as of right now, I don't have to deal with anybody's perception of me besides my clients. That's the only one I care about. Do you have any advice for the budding black entrepreneur, somebody who is thinking about owning a business or considering it or is in the early stages of it, do you have any advice as a business owner? What I would say is the only advice that I have for anybody who's trying to start their own business, especially a black person, uh, is to ask for help. Um, there's a lot of things that, that can be given to you that will cut a lot of your time and wasted time. Um, all of these things have been done before and 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 the thing about it is 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 yes you you might connect well with with another black person but uh, for me I go to whoever can help me to give me the best information so uh, I don't just kind of limit myself to just dealing with black people uh, I like to um, be multicultural with everything, you know, um, I have an Indian um, uh, accountant, I have, you know, different, I got all different types of people in my life. And so um, I would tell anybody, don't get caught up on just um, using black people for all of your advice and all of your help. Uh, spread your wings, but um, be very leery also, um, because uh, sometimes um, all black people aren't good either. And so they, they might burn you also. So uh, it's all about building a great foundation, have good people at your table that gives you advice, um, but also have good boundaries, especially in business, because you never know how other people are running their business or their nonprofit. And, and if you get connected with someone, uh, you might ruin yourself before you even get started a mentor in building your business? Um, to be honest, uh, no. Um, I built I built my business. Um, I, I went in the hospital uh, in 2017. I turned 40 uh, and I went to the hospital for cellulitis in my leg. I went into the um, to the Gulf of Mexico beach uh, and uh, Surfside in Texas and and I ended up catching an infection and I was in the hospital for about eight, nine days. 
And while I was sitting there on the first day, I just thought about, you know, I've been working for the health department 10 years. It would take me another, you know, 20 or another 15 years to retire. Did I want to live that? And I thought about it and I said no. And I started literally building my business right there in the hospital. I had I had nurses running faxes. I, I, I had my cell phone and the hospital phone. And I literally built my business right there before I left. In eight days, I had a full-blown business. Determination has been a theme in your life. I just don't let anything stop me. Like nothing stops me. I, I, I believe in God and, and God has always been a part of my life. And, and, and he's brought me through everything in my life. And I just, I believe I can have anything that I'd ever desire. So once I desire it, I go get it. And I don't let anything or anybody stop me. Is there anything else you want in this piece or anything I, you wished I would have asked you that's formative to your business or your experience? No, no, that's it. I mean, my thing is that I just, I, I love people. Um, I would do this job for absolutely nothing. If I could, if I could counsel the rest of my life and wouldn't earn one dollar, uh, I would be satisfied. That's amazing. Well, David, thank you so much for your time tonight. I promised I wouldn't take over 30 minutes and I think we're just under that. So like I said, this was an incredible interview. I really appreciated listening to you and learning from you and um, we'll be getting back to you soon with a draft of the piece so that you can look it over and make sure that everything uh, is reflective of this conversation and you approve of everything in there and it can, be, it can go public. No problem. All right, and, and I'll be sending see... you the recording of this interview shortly. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much. All Take right. care. Pleasure, bye-bye.